I start off with the hope <laughs> of loving everyone in the sense that I'm a very open, you know, loving person, but I'm also a honey badger, meaning that if you cross me, if you attack me, if you insult me, I'm coming after you, I'm coming after your descendants, I'm coming <laughs> after your ancestors. That's just part of the honey badger mentality. What Amazing. Welcome to The Father State. I am Jesse Lee Peterson. The Father State is on Patreon. So click the Patreon link in the description to support our work. So thank you so much for doing that. Very interesting guest today, Dr. Gad Sad. He is an evolutionary psychologist and professor of marketing at Concordia University. And he has a new book, The Parasitic Mind, How Infectious Ideas Are Killing Common Sense. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, sir. What is evolutionary psychology? Right. So in the same way that we could use evolution to explain why flowers look the way they do or why an animal has particular traits, we can use evolution to study things that have evolved within the human condition. Now, most people are perfectly happy to understand that the reason why we have opposable thumbs is due to some evolutionary reason. But a lot of people get very nervous when you then say that which happens above the neck, meaning the thing that defines your personhood, which is your human mind, right. that too doesn't come from mysterious places. It comes from evolution. So evolutionary psychology is the application of evolutionary theory to understand the human condition. Why are we romantically jealous? Why do we love our children more than random children? Uh, how do you explain altruism? How do you explain genocide? So everything that defines the human condition can be viewed through an evolutionary lens. And so that's what an evolutionary psychologist does. The parasitic mind, you says that how infectious ideas are killing common sense. So at one time, there were more people who had common sense, right? <laughs> right. right. Uh, so basically, I, I argue in the book that I have faced... Uh, two great wars in my life. The first great war was growing up in Lebanon. Uh, we were part of the last Lebanese Jews that had steadfastly refused to leave Lebanon. And uh, we, did, we were happy in Lebanon until it was no longer feasible to be Jewish in Lebanon. And we had to escape, otherwise we would be killed. The second great war that I faced, which speaks to your question, is the great war on reason, on common sense, on logic, on science that I've experienced as a professor of almost 30 years. Uh, you know, you would think that universities are bastions of logic and reason and common sense. Now, some departments are, but others are almost defined by how far they are removed from reason. Yeah. And so I basically, in the book, what I do is I recount the story of all of these, what I call idea pathogens, dreadful ideas, how they were founded in the university setting, and how now they've escaped from the university setting, and now they infect our politics, Hollywood, journalism, uh, HR departments, these, these bad ideas are now everywhere. So can you define common sense for me? Well, common sense is something that your otherwise lying eyes would know to be true, right? So for example, uh, the idea that a nation should have secure borders would be something that any commonsensical person would say, yeah, of course I believe that. Right. But in today's world, if you are, quote, a progressive, that's racist. Common sense would be that only women menstruate. Today, that is <laughs> transphobic. It's also sometimes boys who menstruate. Common sense is that only women bear children. That turns out to be false, according to progressivism. It's sometimes boys, sometimes girls who bear children. So common sense is whatever allows you to navigate through through the world, through your senses that you know to be true. So you're born with common sense, but once you're educated, now you lose the common sense. Am I right? Uh, it depends in which fields you are educated. So, uh, you know, I'm housed in a business school. Uh, so the business school and the engineering school have been less parasitized by these imbecilic ideas because we are coupled to the real world, right? You cannot build a bridge using postmodernist physics because the bridge will collapse. 
You cannot build a model of consumer choice in the economy using postmodernist mathematics because the model won't be able to predict anything. So some fields, because there is a feedback loop tied to reality, they don't permit as much for this stupidity to, to flourish. But in other disciplines, in the social sciences and the humanities, you have complete lunacy being taught to generations of students. Not only is it poisoning their minds, it's a waste of time for everybody. And the hardworking parents who are spending $80,000 a year on tuition are really not going to get a return on their investments. So is that deliberate? Are they deliberately trying to turn the kids away from common sense to craziness? I mean, it depends on the idea pathogen. And at some point, maybe it might be worthwhile for us to discuss what they are. Postmodernism is an idea pathogen. We can discuss it. Militant feminism uh, is another one. Cultural relativism is another one. Some of them are deliberate, right? So, for example, a lot of the progressive ideology seeks to make incoming students hate the West, right? Yeah. You are progressive if you think that you know, the U.S. is a disgusting, racist, transphobic, Islamophobic country. But part of the idea of pathogens is actually was not deliberate. It, it actually started with a noble cause and then it metamorphosized into stupidity. So let me give you a concrete example. Take, for example, equity feminism. Equity feminism is a great idea. It basically says that men and women should be treated under the equally under the law. And I think most people watching the show would say, yeah, of course, I subscribe to that. Men and women should be equal. Militant feminism, though, then pushes the idea much further. It says that in the service of trying to create equality in this, between the sexes, we have to argue that men and women are indistinguishable from each other. Well, yeah. that's nonsense, right? right? So in the service of an original goal that everybody would would, would agree with, we end up murdering the truth. We end up raping the truth in the, per, in the, in the pursuit of that goal. And I always remind people, we can chew gum and walk at the same time. We can be we can be for all sorts of noble goals without ever sacrificing truth at the altar. Amazing. So you were you've been a professor for twenty five years, but you twenty seven. Twenty seven. Amazing. Long time. <laughs> you were Jewish who lived in Lebanon at one time. That's right. Were you were you born there? I was born there, uh, born there in 1964. Uh, my whole family is Lebanese. We've always been in that region since time immemorial. Uh, uh, some of my grandparents were from Syria, which is just the neighboring country to Lebanon. Uh, we, so we are what's called Mizrahi Jews. Mizrahi Jews are the Jews that are Arabic speaking Jews from the region, right? So Algerian Jews, Egyptian Jews, Iraqi Jews, Yemeni Jews, Lebanese Jews. So these are completely Arabized Jews, right? Our culture is Arabic. We, Our mother tongue is Arabic. Our food is Arabic. Our music is Arabic, but we happen to be Jewish. And so I was part, when I say I, I mean my family. I was a kid. I was only 11 years old when we left. I was part of the last group of Jews that had refused to leave Lebanon. My parents were well entrenched within Lebanese society. But then when the civil war broke out, it really became impossible to be Jewish because there was a long list of militia groups, one rougher than the next, who weren't very keen on having Jews being around. And so we really had to flee, you know, by the skin of our teeth. Amazing. I, I grew up thinking that all Jews were white looking. And then I, <laughs> and I discovered... <laughs> That's that's what I that's what I that's what I always joke with people whenever they come after me. I tell them, hey, you better be careful. I am a Jew of color and I outrank you in victimology poker. Don't tell me your sob story about growing up in the hood in Detroit, because my victimology story is going to squash you. And believe it or not, uh, Mr. Peterson, they usually run away because <laughs> as grotesque as it is. For most people, they no longer debate you on the substance of your ideas. They debate you on whether you score higher than them on victimology. If you're yeah. bigger on the victimology, you win. That's right. And so um, in Israel, are all the white Jews in Israel and the ones of color like spread it out the rest of the world? Uh, I mean, in Israel, you have both the, the indigenous Jews, the Jews, you know, the, the, the Mizrahi Jews, but you also have a lot of Ashkenazi Jews who were not in Israel, right? They came from after World War II from, you know, Central Europe and Eastern Europe. Those are the ones that you would consider to be a lot more Caucasian. I think you have a mix of both. But interestingly, to show you that racism exists across 
all peoples of all colors, regrettably. Uh, mm. Even within Israel, you have racism towards, quote, Jews of color, the Arabic Jews, the Indian Jews, the Yemeni Jews, <laughs> the, the Ashkenazi Jews will look at them as the so-called, you know, lower folks. Uh, I mean, not always, but that's been the general story. By the way, when I used, when I was, when I used to be a soccer player, I used to be a called, uh, it's a very pejorative word, I won't repeat the whole word, but it's, I used to be called sand the N-word because... <laughs> Because the the Arabic folks, the the Jews of color, and the Arabic folks, that's what people would would call us, sand n words. So there you have it. Amazing, and so in in uh, Israel right now, they have black Jews that they found somewhere. Okay. Yeah, you, so those are. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, those are what, and then I'll finish my. Yeah, those those are typically the ones that I think you're talking about. They're called Falasha Jews. They're from Ethiopia. Yes. And, and uh, I remember one time I was uh, uh, at my nephew's high school graduation, and this beautiful, he, he went to a Jewish high school, and this beautiful, distinguished looking Ethiopian girl was walking uh, the procession of the graduation. And so I wanted to kind of sense what my parents' reaction would be if I asked them the following question. I said to them, hey, mom, dad, uh, this is many years ago, maybe 25, 30 years ago, before, way before I was married. Uh, I said, that if I brought home a, a black girl, uh, would that be okay with you? They said, is she Jewish? I said, <laughs> okay, she's Jewish. They said, we don't care. So it shows you how people <laughs> create different de- delineation. To them, they didn't give a damn about your skin color. As long as you were Jewish, you're good. You could be black, you could be purple, you could be white. It's all good as long as you're Jewish. That's amazing. How old were you when you left Lebanon? I was uh, 11 years old. I had just turned 11. Uh, so about two weeks after I turned 11, we got out of there. And I, I tell you, I mean, I discussed this uh, in some detail in chapter one of the parasitic mind. The stories, I mean, the things that I saw during that first year of the civil war is more than what a million people should see in their lifetimes. Uh, I mean, you know, the all butchery is always measured in contrast to the Lebanese civil war, because it was the most savage form of hatred because everything in Lebanon is viewed through the tribal prison. That's why I get so upset when all the progressives now talk about identity politics, because I say to them, I am the product of the perfect identity politics society. If you wanna see what happens downstream when you, when you constantly create tribalism between people, Go back and see what happened in Lebanon, because in Lebanon, what you have is you have an internal ID card that so they don't, nobody cares about your height or your, your eye color. What they care about is what's your religious affiliation? Yeah. Are you are you a Maronite Christian? Are you a Sunni Muslim? Are you Jewish? Are you this? Are you that? Uh, the Constitution of Lebanon is all based on religious heritage. The prime minister has to be of a religion. The president has to be of another religion. The number of seats that you get in parliament depends on your religion. So everything is organized. Uh, so there is no individual dignity. You're, you're not Jesse Lee Peterson. You are what your religion is. Right. That's what defines you. You're incidental. Nobody cares about you. What, what tribe do you belong to? And so it really breaks my heart to see that here in the West, we're now adopting the things that I ran away from 45 years ago. It's yeah, that's amazing. Um, um, how do you feel about Knowing all that, how do you feel about the attack upon white people, white America, white people in America? They're blaming them for everything. They really want to demolish them. How do you feel about that? What do you think about that? It's grotesque. I mean, uh, look, it's grotesque when racism is targeting blacks. It's grotesque when racism is targeting purple people. It's grotesque when racism is targeting white people. Any, Any time that you look at someone and you look at some immutable trait of theirs, and you say, I'm going to judge them, whether good or bad, based on this completely irrelevant trait, guess what? You're a racist. So I despise the idea when people do this uh, magical trick where they say, oh, no, but, but, you know, uh, people can't be racist against whites because whites hold the power. Nonsense, right? I mean, there are racist black people, there are racist white people. So I detest this, and again, I say progressive because you see it on university campuses where I live. Yeah. Uh, you have these seminars, you know, how to detoxify yourself of your whiteness, uh, 
yoga to get rid of your whiteness, <laughs> seminar on, I mean, I said, how is this tolerated? Imagine if we replaced the word white with black, we would have a civil war. Yeah. But as long as you're tackling the hapless white, then it's okay. Amazing. And so what religion is a, religion is a purple person? Say again? You said we have purple people, we have black people, we have white people. What was <laughs> religion is a purple person? I don't know. Maybe they're atheists. Who knows? So uh, one last thing about the homeland that you fled. Was sure. it hard for you and your family to leave there? It, it was very hard uh, because what, what, what ended up happening in Lebanon is that the fighting from day to day was so severe that if you went out into the streets, I mean, first of all, you could die in 17,000 different ways. The snipers were always, I mean, as a matter of fact, I would go out of my house and I was told, don't stand here because that's within the line of the snipers over there. You could only stand there. That's what you learn as a child, okay? Amazing. Now, the, the other thing that was very, very rough in Lebanon, I mean, death awaited you at every corner, but one of the best ways to die or one of the most assured way to die is, is that if you actually traveled across Beirut, the city where I lived, there would be these random roadblocks set up by different militia groups. Well, remember I told you that we have this internal ID that has your, your religion on it. Well, if you're stopped at a militia checkpoint and they're not sympathetic to your religion, there's going to be a bullet in your head very quickly. And so thousands wow. and thousands of people would be liquidated in any given day because they would just happen to be driving to go pick up uh, bread during a ceasefire, and then they would be liquidated. So for us as Jews, we had to go through a very, very difficult road from where we lived to get to the airport. As a matter of fact, this might sh shock your audience, we hired... Palestinian militiamen, PLO, at the time, PLO stands for Palestinian Liberation Organization. So these were very, very staunch fighters, Islamic fighters. We hired them to drive us to the airport because at the time, a lot of the military and refugee camps of the Palestinians were around the Beirut International Airport. So there was no way you were going to get to the Beirut International Airport and take a flight to leave if there wasn't somebody who was sympathetic to your cause. Now, of course, if you're hiring PLO militia to take the Jews out of Lebanon, <laughs> you don't know if they're going to take your money, drive you to a ditch, right. put a bullet in your head and say, what a bunch of suckers. We just got their money. So <laughs> imagine us being taken by these guys, not knowing if they're going to kill us the next second or if they're actually going to be honorable. So this is the kind of life that I lived growing up. So that's why I'm not very sympathetic when people whine about their victim, you know, where, yeah. where LeBron James whines that he has to go through the dangerous route from his Malibu home to the Staples Center <laughs> because, you know, there's a daily genocide of people of color in the United States. You know what? You're pissing me off and you are, I mean, forgive me for saying, you are urinating on, on those who have truly been victims. Yeah. And that's why I have no sympathy for, for a pampered guy like him. That's right. One other thing, why didn't the Jewish people defend themselves from the attack there? Because we were a very, very tiny minority. We're, I mean, you're talking, uh, you know, I might get some of the numbers wrong, but uh, if let's say at the time Lebanon was maybe a country of about 3 million people, you're talking about less than 1,000 Jews in Lebanon. Oh. So it, it's not as though, you know, there was much that we could have done to defend ourselves. And the Jews were not well entrenched, you know, within the military, because, you know, Jews can't do this and Jews can't, you know, people don't understand what true systemic, I mean, when we had in the US slavery, that was systemic racism, that was real institutionalized hatred. One group says, you are less than me. Well, that's how it is in the Middle East with Jews, right? Everything in the Middle East is viewed through the prism of Jew hatred. If it rained today, Goddamn Jews. If it's sunny today, <laughs> goddamn Jews. If you got diabetes, go, those goddamn Jews not giving us the cure for diabetes. Your wife cheated on you. Who put those sin sinful thoughts in her head? It's the damn Jews. Everything is the Jews. So, you know, don't whine when you're in the West about your victimology. Others have had it much worse. So one other thing about that, I noticed that, well, at least I think I know, wherever the Jews set up, where, it doesn't matter if there are a few of them, a whole bunch of them, 
they seem to get rich. <laughs> <laughs> How, what's the secret to the Jews getting so much wealth? So I think it's not, I mean, I think wealth is the consequence of the real answer, which is creating a culture of excellence, okay? And I'll give you a story here, uh, Mr. Peterson, that I think hopefully your viewers would find inspiring. It's, I actually discuss it in the book. After I, so I, I did an undergraduate degree in mathematics and computer science, so rather technical prestigious degree. After that, I did an MBA. And I, was, I knew that I was gonna go on for my PhD because I always wanted to be a professor. I was interested in academia. One of the places I was accepted at I ended up going to Cornell University, but I was also accepted at several other schools, one of which was University of California, Irvine in Southern California. Yeah. My brother at the time lived in Southern California. He was a very successful businessman. And he wanted to convince me to maybe take a break after my MBA, work with him a few years, then I could go back and you know do my PhD. Well, when I returned to Montreal, after having visited him and visiting UC Irvine, when my mother caught wind of the fact that my brother was trying to convince me to take a break after my MBA, she took me to a side uh, uh, you know, room in, in her house and she said, oh, I hear that your brother's trying to convince you. I said, yeah. She goes, do you want to shame the family? Do you want people to think that you are a school dropout? Now, why am I saying that story? I already had an MBA, <laughs> but from her perspective, leaving after an MBA would bring shame to the family. It would be like, I'm a dropout. OK, now, of course, I didn't pursue a Ph.D. because I'm trying to impress her or you know, because of my parents. But it gives you a sense of the 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 exacting code of excellence that's expected of you. It's ingrained in you from day one. You better be this. You better do that. Not unlike how if I don't know if you're familiar with it, there is a lady, a professor at Yale University. She wrote a best selling book in 2011 called The, the Battle Hymn of the, the Tiger Mom. She's an Asian woman uh, of, of Chinese descent. And she was talking about how she tiger parents her children, which is very much similar to the Jewish tradition. Academic excellence, rigor, read books, you know, you better become a doctor or whatever. And so I think that's what ultimately results in the success of the Jews, some of which results in great wealth, of course. Amazing. One other thing about that I want, now I understand. So all Jews are wealthy because they're well educated. It's like a standard of life for them. I mean, not, I mean, of course, there are Jews who've made it big and who are not uh, necessarily, you know, they don't have PhDs and MDs right. and so on. But but there is this there is this constant reminder coming from your culture, from your family, from all the points around you that it is incumbent on you to succeed. You have to do well in life. It's important to be educated. It's important to honor right. your family name. And that, I think, also comes, at least speaking for me, not for all Jews, being from the Middle East, we also have a culture of honor and shame, right? So it's very important to save face. It's very important to have honor, to oh. walk dignified, to not be shamed. So you don't want to fail because then shame brings uh, I mean, a failing, failure, failure brings shame to the family. So I think it's a whole cocktail of cultural values that makes it incumbent on us to succeed. When I was growing up, blacks had the same mentality. And I grew up in Alabama on, on a Jim Crow on a plantation, but they had that sense of family shame. You, you couldn't, if you got pregnant out of wedlock, you have to get a shotgun wedding or you have to go and hide if a woman did that. Or you can't be begging, you can't be weak, you have to buy land, you have to work. And they had that shame prior to the civil rights movement. But after that, they lost that shame. And now all they are doing is blaming others. They, they have no shame about anything. Very destructive. They're blaming it on racism when it's really the destruction of the family and turning their lives over to the government and Amen. having black leaders. And so it has nothing to do with the white folks at all, but everything to do with the, the loss of shame, no, no self-dignity or respect. How, how do you, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so delighted to hear you say that. It's as if I'm sitting next to Larry Elder, who I think many, <laughs> says the exact same things that you do, right? I mean, he, I remember the first time that I discovered uh, Elder, 
it was he was talking about his dad and 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 it's exactly what you're just describing about your experience in Alabama, right? It's yeah. it's a dignified man. I'm gonna do whatever I need to do, right? He always says, "You get out of life what you put into it." Yeah. That, that, that's dignified. That's walking tall, right? In Arabic, you say it's having sharaf. Sharaf means you have a strong personhood. Yeah. So let me ask you a question, if I may. Yeah. What explains the fact? if I'm speaking about the black community, that you have folks like you, Larry Elder, and you know people with great sense of honor and, and integrity, and yet so many others that are parasitized by the victimology bug. What, what explains whether you fall on this side or that side of the divide? <laughs> well, we, most, most of the blacks who, who think as I do and work hard and don't blame, they grew up with fathers and grandfathers and grandmothers. And that oh. made the difference because the fathers and grandmother and grandfathers, even the, the mothers and grandmothers, wouldn't put up with the crap. They wouldn't <laughs> accept you for being weak. And they, they taught you that at 18, as a male, you got to leave home. But they prepared us to work. If they want to go to school, go to school, but to take care of yourself. And I've never looked back. When I left at 18, I never looked back because they had taught me how to save my money, buy home, buy land, and and respect others and never wimp and blame. So I've always had that because my father and my grandfather and my grandmothers were that way. They didn't allow it as well as my mother. They didn't so allow it. So you're, you're, so in, in that sense, you're exactly right. That what, what I was telling about my mother is exactly the same story that you're saying in yeah. a different context. So it shows what it means to have strong parental influence. You know, here's, here's another stat that you might find interesting. You know what's one of the biggest predictors of your children succeeding? It's how many books there are in your parents' home. So right now in the in this in the in my study where I'm sitting, my entire study is filled with my personal library. And I always joke with my children. I tell them, you are destined to be successful because if you only read all the books that are in this library, yeah. you're going to be the most educated <laughs> people walking the face of the earth. That's Just right. But that's what makes it different today. So blacks, uh, uh, they destroyed the family. They put other people over them, like Jesse Jackson and all those people. They started to rely on the government, so they took the father out of the home, and it's just been downhill ever since. I want to ask one other thing about the Jews, I think. So some people believe that what's happening in America today is the fault of the Jews, that they own the media, they own everything. And that they don't want a wall to go up around America because they want to change the way America is. They control the media because they own the media. Are all those things true? No. Is, is, is Fox owned by Jews? It, it, look, uh, I think that it is. I think what ends up happening is that because the Jews are very few in numbers and yet they wield such influence, it becomes easy to construe them as scheming and diabolical, right? Yeah. I mean, I'll give you an, I'll give you a very concrete example. I mean, and, and again, I, I I know all about the psychology of anti-Semitism because I've lived it in such profound personal ways, right? So let me give you an example that's that's not a that's not a manifestation of anti-Semitism, but it it speaks to the point that you're asking. I've appeared on the Joe Rogan show many times. He's a, he's a very good friend of mine. He's certainly not anti-Semitic in the least bit. On one of the shows, I had asked him to estimate how many Jews do you think there are in the world, Joe? And maybe I don't want to put you on the spot, Mr. Peterson, but do you mind if I ask you that same question? I don't mind, but I have no idea at all. I have no idea. Give me the biggest. Give me give me the first guess that comes to mind. Just give me whatever number you want. Okay, around the world, around the world, how many Jews are walking the earth? Uh, Don't worry, I won't embarrass you. 500,000 or so. Okay, well, that, that, that's the opposite of what I was expecting <laughs> you to say. So usually what people say is that they greatly overestimate the number. So, I, so in the case of Joe Rogan, he said, oh, how many Jews? I'm going to go with about a billion. Then I said, okay, is that your final number? He said, okay, no, 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 500 million. I said, is that your final number? He said, yes, 500 million. I said, well... Fasten your seatbelt. There are 14 million Jews in the world. So then he didn't believe me. He tells his producer, his name is Jamie. He goes, Jamie, I don't believe that BS. <laughs> check it, check it. And then he checks it and it comes back. He goes, God damn, you're right. Now, why am I saying all this? Because 
most people greatly overestimate how many Jews there are because how come those bastards are leading Hollywood and leading Nobel Prize winners? And the, Well, that's what we talked about earlier. Yeah. It's because we work super hard. It's because from the day we come out of the womb, we're expected to be Nobel Prize winners. So we end up having an over abundance of success compared to our very small numbers yeah and so that then causes right remember the bible has one of the 10 deadly sin or one of the 10 commandments don't covet right yeah. or in the or the the seven deadly sins one of them is envy so what ends up happening is i look at the jew over there god damn why is he so successful he must be diabolical there must be something satanic that they are so and so that's how you create the anti-semitic tropes are the Jews controlling the banks? Are they controlling the media? We're not controlling anything. We work hard. Some of us become successful. Others don't. There is no global Jewish conspiracy. At least if there is, nobody's invited me to that. <laughs> I should just say five million, but I don't see many Jews. If I do, I don't recognize them, so I don't know. <laughs> um, I want to ask, so are you a religious Jew? I'm not. Uh, so I'm... You know, being Jewish is truly a multifactorial construct. So you can say Jewish and that do you practice Judaism? But it's also being Jewish is a ethnicity. It's a shared historical heritage with a lineage of almost 6,000 years. It's shared misery through years of anti-Semitism. So I could be very Jewish in my identity as I am without in the least bit, you know, believing in the practice of the religion of Judaism. So, for example, I don't believe that if we eat a juicy uh, <laughs> old pork sandwich, uh, God is going to send us to whatever. He's going to punish us. So to me, I think I can being Jewish is part of my identity. Having green eyes is part of my identity, but it doesn't define me. What really defines me is the totality of my qualities and my faults. I, I want people to judge me on who God said is rather mm -hmm. than whether I'm Jewish or that. So, but to answer your question, no, I'm not very religious. And so do you believe in God at all? Uh, if it's God in the sense of how most people view it, no, a personal God, no, a guy who's a, a granddaddy who is, uh, you know, controlling things, no. I, I, I'm going to answer this not to be coy or to be evasive. I think that there are majestic, divine things for us to experience that don't require a supernatural cause. You, you see what I'm saying? I can go to the Grand Canyon and experience the majesty of nature, and it, I don't have to pin it on God. I could meet Jesse Lee Peterson. We could become friends and become buddies, and, uh, and I could love him, and I don't have to care about God. In other words, I see divinity in the world without it being couched in the language of monotheism, right? That there is some kind of God. So in that sense, then I would have to say, I don't believe in God, although I do believe in the divinity of life. Where do you get your values from, if not from God? Uh, well, uh, evolution uh, has endowed us with a moral compass in the exact same way that it has endowed us with the pancreas that we have and the heart that we have and the brain that we have. Part of being a, a functioning human being is to have an evolved moral compass. And so the idea that many religious people argue, which is, sure, I understand that evolution holds true, but you can't use evolution to explain morality. That's simply not true. There's There have been countless books, countless scientific studies published by innumerably brilliant scientists that offer very compelling reasons why human beings should be moral and none of those reasons have anything to do with god now if it makes you if it gives you solace to and and comfort to believe that there must be some ultimate moral arbiter called god more power to you that's no problem but i don't think that you need god to be moral as a matter of fact i think it it violates the beauty of being moral if you are moral because of god i am a good person irrespective of whether God is there or not. I'm not a good person because God dictated for me to be so. And, so therefore, I'm truly pure in that sense. And what is good about you? 
what is good about me? What, what's your, you're asking me to brag about myself. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, it, if the people don't mind that I speak of myself since you asked, uh, I think I'm a very pure person, maybe even maladaptively pure, maybe too pure. I'm very, I'm very honest. I'm, I don't do BS. That's, by the way, harmed my career because, as you know, if you are a straight talker in all situations, people get offended. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not, I'm not impolite, but I call it like it is. That's why I have become a famous professor because I don't play all the, the BS games. I don't play the politically correct game. I call it like it is. If I think that Islam has a problem with violence, I call it as it is. I don't care about your hurt feelings because the truth is more important than your hurt feelings. So I think probably the quality that I am most proud of is the fact that I walk tall, dignified, even though I'm not a tall person, I walk tall, dignified, and protected by the truth. Amazing. In your book, you said, oh, let me ask, do you love all people? Uh, I don't love pedophiles. I don't like, I don't love anti-Semites. I don't love defamers. I have a, I have a group of defamers right now headed by literally a white supremacist who have been coming after me. I simply can't believe that such evil exists. So no, I'm not Jesus Christ. I'm not turn your cheek, your other cheek. I'm not love all people. I start off with the hope <laughs> of loving everyone in the sense that I'm a very open you know, loving person, but I'm also a honey badger, meaning that if you cross me, if you attack me, if you insult me, I'm coming after you, I'm coming after your descendants, I'm coming <laughs> after your ancestors. That's just part of the honey badger mentality. What Amazing. Can I, say? I love all, as a Christian, I love all people. I hate no one and I'll deal with people, but I don't, I don't uh, take it personal. I know that because they have not returned to the father, been born of God, they don't yes. have love, so they can't help themselves. But yet but I never, deal with them straight up. But you never feel uh, hatred towards someone who's been vicious or hurt a child or raped five women? It, it, you, you don't feel hate in your heart for them? Not at all, because I realize that they, they have fallen away from God, and right. sa their, Satan is their daddy, and Satan is influencing them to do it. They think well, that they're, they're, they're a better they're, man than me because <laughs> when I see that, I have hate in my heart. So maybe yeah. I need to learn from you. Well, God said that if we don't love all, we love none. And this right. simply means don't hate. Um, what is a, a man? By man, you mean literally male or do you mean man as in mankind? Man, yeah. What is a male who is supposed to be a man? Uh, someone who, uh, well, certainly uh, has personal agency. So we were talking earlier about uh, victimology. Those people who always blame others for their failings are not men, yeah. right? A man, again, to, not to keep using that euphemism, but uh, walking tall is a man. It's someone who is dignified. Any job that you do, whether you're a bus driver or you're cleaning latrines That's or right. you're a neurosurgeon, you walk tall. You're proud of what you do. You do it to the best of your abilities. That's a man. So again, it's the concept in Arabic of sharaf, strong personhood, integrity, honor, uh, You know, making sure you never shame yourself. Look, I'll tell you a quick story. People tell me, why do you take on all these personal and professional risks to be so outspoken? You know, you've got a great career as a professor. You don't need to take on all those extra burdens and pressures. And I always tell, because this is going to answer your question about what it is to be a man. I always tell them that at the end of the night, when I go to sleep and I put my head on the pillow, in order for me not to have insomnia, I need to feel that I was true to myself. I was true to truth. I never walked away yeah. from an opportunity to better the world. I was never cowardly. If I were to be cowardly, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night because I would hate myself. I would feel as though I'm a fraud. And so I think if you live life with that kind of dignified attitude, yeah. that makes you a man. That's amazing. I, when you were speaking those things, it reminded me of when I was growing up on the plantation. We had to work the cotton fields and pick corn and do all those things. But we did it with a sense of gratitude. We were proud. We didn't, we didn't think that it was a less job, you know. And all that is gone now. And that's why I, another reason I said there's no such thing as racism, no such thing as racism, sexism, 
homophobism, Islam, or Allah Abbaism, or or anti Semitism, or white supremacists. It's either right or wrong, good or evil. But the world, the world, give it different names so that you don't see the reality of what it is. It's either good or evil. I I I agree. Listen. uh, this, by the way, if I may use some fancy professorial terms, what you just said is what's called in ethics, it's called deontological thinking. So there are two types of ethical systems. It's going to speak exactly to your point. Deontological statement is, if I say the following, it is never okay to lie. That's an absolute statement. A consequentialist ethical statement would be, it's okay to lie if you're trying to spare someone's feelings, okay? Okay. So for some things, for some things, it's okay to be consequentialist, right? I mean, if, if you want to have a successful long-term marriage and your spouse tells you, do I look fat in those jeans, sweetie? <laughs> you better put on that consequentialist hat and lie if you have to. But when it, but when it comes to the truth, I, I should have been a Baptist preacher. <laughs> on the other hand, but, but I don't think they go for Jewish Baptist preachers. But, anyway, but, but if you are talking about the defense of the truth, right, or those moral absolutes that we were talking about, then it's exactly what you're saying. There's right, there is wrong. There is no equivocating. There is no temperance. It's black or white. Bingo. Amazing. So time is going by fast. I'm totally enjoying this conversation, so we do have to move a little faster. In your book, you said uh, your life ideas are freedom and truth. What is freedom and what is truth? Right, so... Well, truth is what we've been talking about all this time. Uh, truth is that women menstruate, not men. Yeah. Truth, right? Truth is that there are innate sex differences between the two sexes, right? So there are certain truths that we can pursue, uh, unencumbered by political correctness, unencumbered by all the progressive nonsense. Uh, as a scientist, I wake up every day thinking that there are truths out there for me to discover. So. My entire life's edifices is built on the pursuit of truth. Now, freedom, I mean it much more than just you know, freedom of speech and so on, although that is what I mean. And so I give examples in the book of other situations where freedom really mattered to me. And so let me give you an example from my soccer playing days. I used to be a very competitive soccer player uh, heading to Europe to play professionally. Then I had a, a big injury. Well, I used to play what's called the number 10 position. The number 10 position is the playmaker. It's the player that typically has the most, it's like a point guard in in basketball. It's the guy who distributes the ball. It's the guy who typically has the best skills. Well, part of being the playmaker is to have the freedom to move around the field looking for spaces to exploit. And so my brain functioned in this manner. I viewed the world as either free or not free. Now, when a coach would come along who would try to restrict my movement, he would say, okay, today you're playing a bit more on the left side of midfield and you're going to have to track back and cover Jesse. That would put a constraint on me and therefore I was no longer free to create. And so for me, the concept of freedom is central to everything I do. Freedom of speech, freedom to do any research I want, freedom to publish in any journal I want, freedom to move around in the soccer field anywhere I want. So freedom and truth is everything. The rest is details. I love that. That makes sense. What is love? Well, I guess it depends on what kind of love we're talking. I think we can talk about romantic love, which is one type. We can talk about love for our children, love for our pets. Many people there's actually been studies that have looked at, are you more likely to j- walk into or jump into a, build, a burning building to save a hapless puppy or some random person? And you'll be surprised <laughs> to know that a, a large number of people would rather save a puppy than some random stranger. So I think there isn't a singular concept of love. I think there are different ways by which we instantiate love depending on the target. Uh, I, do you have any children? I do. Yeah. So would you not agree that maybe the way that you love your children is is uniquely different than the way you love your spouse? At one time, it used, well, I, I, at one time, I, I know that spouse is, is sexual, so it's not like that. But right. at one time, I had categories of love for different people, right? But once I returned to the father, I have the same love for all. 
And to me, love is simply not hating. And that's why I'm able to love my enemy because I don't hate my enemy. Now, I'll deal with my enemy in a strong way, but I don't hate my enemy. But does that does does your sort of universal definition of love apply to other beings, like other than humans? Can you can you love your dog in the same way that you would your children and wife, or or is your concept of love defined to 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 human love? Well, I would treat all things, all humans and animals, the same. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be all emotional, but I would not be rude to an animal. I wouldn't walk down the road and kick the dog, you know. Right. Sure. I wouldn't do that kind of thing because of the love that I have. I would deal with the dog as a dog, but I would deal with the human as a human, but all with love. Got it. That's that's beautiful. I like it. Amazing. So I, I, I want to talk about this uh, truth versus hurt feelings. In your book, you have a chapter where you talk about Truth versus hurt feeling, and you give a, a good example of the great white hope. You talk about the hysterical reaction to the uh, great white hope's uh, election. Can you explain that? You know who the great white hope is, right? Yeah, yeah. I call him Orange Himmler. <laughs> uh, I yes. love the great white hope. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, look. Uh, and yes, together we <laughs> will make America great again. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, when I when I saw the reaction of my supposedly intellectual colleagues, fancy professors, to Donald Trump's election, I thought, boy, I I need to write a book about this insanity because it didn't make any sense that people who've dedicated their life to supposedly think clearly, be reasoned, look at evidence, suddenly lost it in ways that could only be described as a mental illness. And hence, that's why I talk about the parasitic mind. It's literally yeah. parasites that are infecting your brain. And so in trying to explain this, I thought, well, how can I explain this? So let me, let me give, I want to give you a, imagine that this prop here, this pen is a, the cork of a wine bottle. Okay. All right. There is an expression in Arabic that says, getting drunk simply by smelling the cork of the wine bottle, which means what? It means that I'm so weak that it doesn't take me to actually drink the wine to get drunk. I just have to take a, a <laughs> whiff of the wine cork and I'm already drunk. Now, how can I apply this to Donald Trump? Well, what people are saying is, he's ugly, he's vulgar, he's fat, he's an ogre. He speaks like a brawler from Queens. He must be disgusting. On the other hand, watch, I'm going to get drunk now by the cork of noble prophet Barack Obama. <laughs> Barack Obama, he's tall. He has a mellifluous voice. He's got a radiant smile. He speaks with lovely cadence. Even though every single syllable he says is a complete empty platitude of big pile of BS. Yes. <laughs> my God, I'm, I'm getting drunk. You see, look, I'm getting drunk. So what's happening here is I'm getting intoxicated by my emotional system, my, my feelings, right? I hate Trump. He disgusts me. I love Barack. But if you are judging someone for such an important role as to be your president, you shouldn't be activating your feelings. Yeah. You should be activating your cognitive system, right? So even though many of my colleagues loved much more the policy positions of Trump, they couldn't get behind them because he's disgusting and vulgar. So this is what I mean by the tension between feelings versus thinking. Amazing. That is interesting. Um, I noticed that a lot of people are caught up in their emotions today. What caused that and why are so many people like that? Because I think it's a lot quicker to deploy your emotions, right? So think about when, if you were to attack me, what happens? My blood pressure rises, my uh, heart rate starts going up, right? Because I have to deploy the system very quickly to respond to your attack. So your emotional system is one that is quickly to deploy, right? So yeah. I could either spend a lot of effort thinking about the policy positions of Trump versus Biden, which take a lot of effort and I'm too lazy to actually sit there and think about it. Or I could just very quickly deploy my emotional system. Since most people are cognitively lazy, they then rely on their emotions, right? Yeah. I hate Trump. Obama is a prophet. 
vote for Obama, he'll save us. Trump is disgusting. Don't go for him. It's as simple as that. Yeah. People are idiots. <laughs> I noticed that emotional people make the wrong decisions too because of that emotional reaction and yeah. not, it's not logical, it's not common sense. Exactly right. Look, but by the way, this doesn't mean that there is no role for your emotional system to play in your life because that also is part of evolution, right? If I walk down a dark alley because I'm trying to take a shortcut to get home and I see four young men loitering around in that dark alley, my heart rate's gonna go up. I'm yeah. gonna start sweating. My, my blood pressure goes up. In that sense, my emotional system made perfect sense. But if I'm trying to solve a calculus problem on a university exam, triggering my emotional system is not going to help me do well on the math exam. So it's not so much that we are a reasoning animal or a thinking animal. We're both. The trick is to know when to activate which system. Nice. And so are your children growing up with common sense? Big time, big time, because, uh, listen, it's, it's uh, if I may speak of myself, it's hard to grow up with me as their dad, <laughs> with, with them not being expected to think clearly. So, for yeah. example, just a couple of weeks ago, I actually did a, a clip of this on, on my own channel where I sat down with my son. He's, he's nine years old. And I said to him, could you write down in your journal, give me the reasons why you think it's ever OK to lie? or if it's never okay to lie. So I was doing the whole deontological versus consequentialist, but he's nine years old and he had to sit there for you know, 20, 25 minutes at the cafe writing out that stuff. Well, this goes back to what we talked about earlier when you said it's all about having a father present and a mother present. Well, imagine the kid who doesn't have the fatherly attention yeah. that I just gave that little boy for those 25 minutes. He's already ahead of the game because he got that exercise from me. Now imagine all those other kids, whether they are growing up in uh, Appalachia, in uh, North, whatever, or they're growing up in the ghetto. Once you don't have both parents, you're already way behind in the game. And so that's that's what we need to, we need to bring back the family. And, and yes, and that's what's wrong with most blacks. It's the family, it's not racism, it's not white people, it's the family. I gotta ask, you talk about Islamic and O S T R I C H. Oh, Paras ostrich. Ostrich, ostrich parasitic syndrome. Yes. Parasitic syndrome. In a few words or less, what is that? So, an ostrich, as you, you know, the metaphor is that it buries its head in the sand because it wants to avoid reality. And so, when I say ostrich parasitic syndrome, what I'm referring to is this, uh, this malady of the human mind whereby people refuse to accept things that are as clear as gravity. So for example, if you have 37,000 terror attacks since 9-11 alone, I'm not exaggerating, those, those are documented, those are listed. There have been over 37,000 terror attacks in over 70 countries since 9-11 alone committed in the name of one religion. And then you go to Western folks and say, so do you think that maybe the religion has anything to do with it? Which, by the way, in those 37,000 cases, the ones who committed the act will tell you on tape that they're doing it because of their religion. Then you get the Westerners who tell you, oh, no, it's because of climate change. It's because of beard bullying. It's, be it's because of lack of art exposure. If only we had sent those lovely Muslim people to go to the museum more, they wouldn't have blown us up in Yemen and in Paris. That's ostrich parasitic syndrome because it's saying no amount of evidence that I can show you can get you to see the reality as it is. That's a very dangerous way to navigate through life. That's amazing. I love the idea uh, that uh, topping on Islam and ostrich parasitic syndrome. It made so much sense. Um, I got to ask, uh, we talked, you said there's never a time to lie, right? To, well, it depends. It's, it, oh, if, okay. If, you're, if your spouse is asking you, do I look fat in those jeans? Please lie. <laughs> but how about if, let's say you lived over in the country, Lebanon, and your child ran into the house because someone was chasing your child to try to hurt it, hurt, hurt him, and he hides under the bed, and the people break in and like, where's your son? I saw your son come in. You're no, going to lie and say he never lie. came in. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I would say lie. That, so that, that's, that's exactly an example of consequentialist ethics, right? Because you're saying that 
it's okay to commit a lie in, if the consequence is to save a child's life. Yeah. A lie is not as much of an infraction as to actually cause the child to die. So this is why I think that deontological, meaning never doing something, has to be reserved for the most extreme of cases. So for example, when you are defending the truth with a capital T, you should never lie, right? You should always, that's why the scientific method is such a beautiful thing, because if you are a truly honest scientist, you just pursue the science yeah. unencumbered by political correctness. If the data shows that men are superior on a task, I report it this way. If the data show that women are superior, I report it this way. I don't hide my data so I don't hurt somebody's feelings. Yes. Then you are being untruthful. I love that. You're absolutely right. University and, and postmodernism. What is that? Right. So postmodernism is a dreadful idea pathogen, which basically says that there are no universal truths. We are always shackled by subjectivity. We are always shackled by personal biases. So you could never say that something is true. Well, that's complete nonsense, right? Because <laughs> it is absolutely true that on average, men are taller than women. Yeah. That, by, right? It is absolutely true that if I jump off the Empire State Building 100 times, I will come up with the same conclusion every 100, 100 <laughs> times. I will die because there's a thing called gravity. Yeah. You know, the idea that there is no universal truth that we can speak of is insane. I, I basically, I had a, I had a conversation once with a graduate student, a postmodernist. I discussed this in the book, where she wouldn't concede to me that only women bear children, and she wouldn't concede to me that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west because she wasn't willing to concede. What do you mean by east and west? Yeah. And what do you mean by the sun? That which you call the sun, I call dancing hyena. <laughs> to which I said, well, okay, the dancing hyena rises in the east and sets in the west. So when you get into this kind of intellectual terrorism, it serves nobody any purpose. That's what postmodernism is. It should be discarded with because it's polluting thousands of young minds for no purpose. Uh, you are a professor at a Christian university. Has that hey, been no, it's not. Sorry to interrupt you. It's not the Concordia that you're familiar with. Oh. You're, you're it up. There, there's, a, there's a Lutheran Concordia schools in the United States that you're exactly right are Christian schools. I'm, I'm at Concordia University in Canada. It's a non-denominational. It's got nothing to do with those Christian schools. Oh, okay. Because I wonder how were you a uh, Jewish teaching professor at <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I'm at a secular school. Oh, okay. So I got to heat this up. I got to put you on the hot seat. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Go for and, it. And I need you to answer these questions as quickly as possible. Okay. The hot seat. Are you a feminist? Uh, yes, if it means equity feminism. No, if it means militant feminism. Who has more privilege, black people or gay people? Uh, in today's victimology poker, maybe gay people. Uh, do you love white people? I love all people. I don't care about your skin color. In one word, describe Joe Biden. Avocado. <laughs> because for avocado brain, mush for brain. Is the climate change real? It is, but we don't necessarily are able to change anything about it. What is a woman? Uh, the the uh, complement to a man. Is it possible to have perfect peace? No. Did the woman come from man or God? From evolution. Are you the head of your wife? Uh, no, we both have different complementary skills. Once we're together, we're a formidable pair. Are you married to an educated woman? Uh, yep. Oh, okay. And Lebanese woman, too. Really? <laughs> you got two Lebanese people in the household. That's some honey badger attitude right there. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, do you smoke pot? I have never smoked a single thing in my entire life. Not one thing. Not one toke of a cigarette. Amazing. Did you have fun? I had a great time. You are such a delight. Thank you so much for having me on. And thank you for coming on. I totally enjoyed you. Can you tell the people how to get your books, your podcast, and whatever else you want to give out? So thank you. Uh, so uh, you can get my latest book, The Parasitic Mind. It just came out on uh, paperback. It's been out for a year. Uh, check it out if you care about what's happening to your children's brains in school. 
you can follow me on uh, Twitter at, at Gad, G-A-D-S-A-A-D. I also have a show called The Sad Truth, Sad, S-A-A-D. I invite all sorts of amazing guests and we have great conversations like the one we had here. So there's all kinds of places you can connect with me. I hope that you'll reach out. Cheers. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Gad Sad. I really enjoyed you. And, and thank you folks for tuning in. Don't forget to let us hear from you. Ring the bell. Check out the merch and Patreon. The Father's Day. Father's Day is on Patreon, so check that out. Help us get the word out there. Thank you folks for tuning in. I appreciate it. Thanks for watching the Father State. Don't forget to like, follow, subscribe. Support my nonprofit at rebuildingdemand.com and tell everybody and their mama about the show.